Well, hello, good day, everybody. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you in your homes. I guess most of you are in your homes right now with this crazy COVID thing going around. I sure am looking forward to all of us getting together and being together at our Feast of Tabernacles or something some, sometime soon, and even more so to being together forever and ever and ever and ever for all eternity. Godspeed that day. Well, welcome to God's Holy Sabbath day, God's sacred day that he put his presence into. You know, last year, 2020, was quite a year, wasn't it? And we certainly don't want, uh, we, we hope it gets better, but unfortunately, we know the year is coming up to the very return of the Christ is going to be very ugly. And so, though last year was record number of hurricanes, we had the wildfires, the bushfires in Australia, and many other countries, we had the worst hurricanes, not so much in America, but boy, Honduras, Costa Rica, those places, they really got hit hard, really hard. The most uh, hurricanes in history. And then the riots, the burning, the lootings, the killings that went on all summer long. And then the tested, the contested election. And COVID-19 going all over the world, uh, messing everybody's life up. And now we're getting all these other strains coming. God's kingdom come, right? May God's kingdom come. Now, our, our Messiah told us we won't know the day nor the hour. But certainly, he said, be watching for the uh, leaves and buds on the olive tree, the fig tree, I think he said, on the fig tree. And uh, so, you, you know, summer is nigh. And I think most of us believe things are beginning to happen. And maybe individually, uh, we don't know. My end time, your end time, could be any time with a stroke, heart attack, car accident, whatever it might be. So we have to be close to our Messiah, to, to our God as never before during these times. So anyway, um, the very end of days, the days of God's wrath, seem like they could be here very, very shortly. We're also told that God's children should know that we're close to the things that are happening. If you look at 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, we who are in the light are not caught off guard. We are told, we are given the, the, the knowledge it's gonna happen soon. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it goes on to say, For we are not, we are not appointed to wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So God's children at the very end time also seem to be split. I think most of us, I think we do agree with this, that some of God's children are very zealous and are working hard and know their God, have not denied his name, and they're going to be spared from the hour of trial that's coming upon the whole world. I think that's Revelation 3.10 or something like that. And then we know also there are those who are lukewarm, whom God doesn't know so much, whom God says, I counsel that, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go through the fire of trial, the fire of testing to purge out what needs to be purged. And so some will go through terrible, terrible end times, and some we hope and pray, will be spared it. I want to be among the latter, the ones that are spared it. But let me say this now, too. As we talk about what we... My topic today is three things. Three things we need to be focused on in these end times as God's children. There are lots of things to focus on. I'm going to talk about three of them. Three basic things that I don't know we're doing so well that I know I need to do better on. But first, let me ask you, how special are you as part of God's elect to him and to the whole world? How special are you? We know it says in Romans 8, 22 and 23, you know this verse, that all creation, all creation is groaning like in childbirth, waiting for your redemption, for you being changed into a full child of God in a spirit body that is redeemed and starting the whole new world that will come about as a, as a, as a result. I, I'm posting the scripture up there, which you know well, that even we groan inwardly. Then another verse you know well, that the end time will bring great tribulation as never before. And then in verse 22 of Matthew 24, Matthew 24, 22, 
unless the days, it's going to be so bad that unless God shortens the days, nobody would even be saved alive. You know that verse. But for the elect's sake, let's make it more personal. Because of you, what's your name? Bill, Mary, Susan, Mike, Sherwin, what's your name? But because of you, Almighty God shortens the time and saves human life alive when the way it's been going, if you read the book of Revelation, one third of humanity killed here and so many killed there. It's not looking very good, except for you. Because you were active with God, he saves humanity from extinction. So here are the three goals that, so you are going to be an active part of the elect. Number one, very basic, but I'm challenging you. These are not suggestions from God's word. These are not ideas or like them or leave them kind of things from Yeshua the Christ. These are commands. Number one, pray like you've never prayed before. Did you pray today? Have you prayed today? Did you pray yesterday? How many times? Once, twice, three times? If you were Daniel or David, it'd be at least three times. We're in the worst times ever about to start. Certainly, perhaps, in the lifetime of most of us listening to this today. Pray more fervently, more consistently, longer, more often than you ever have in your whole lifetime. Why pray? Because Yeshua had told us in John 15, 5, again, another verse you should know really well. Abide in me, and I abide in you, and you will bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. But if you abide in me, if you hang in there tight with me, you will bear much fruit. John 15, verse 5. I reworded it a little bit, but that's the essence of it. Philippians 4.13, another well-known verse. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Paul said it in a personal way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If we're not praying a lot, I mean a lot in these coming years, I mean a lot, where will the strength come from? Where will the fruit come from? Prayer is our lifeline. God has given us an open door, an ability to come to him 24-7, any time we want. We can pick up that phone, so to speak, to God and start talking. We have a clear line. We don't have to go through Verizon or AT&T. We just have to say, Holy Father in heaven, our dear Abba, and you've got his attention. That's all it takes. And many of us, like Adam and Eve, who I don't know how long they went before they even thought of taking of the tree of life. It was there. They didn't go the first day, obviously. Or maybe the second or the third or maybe the first week or maybe the first month. I don't know how long they were. Some think it was quite some time before they finally had Satan come into the garden. Why didn't they take advantage of it? We can't judge them. Are we doing any better? Are we joyfully and boldly coming before the throne of grace? You know, as a father and grandfather, I just love it. It doesn't happen all that often, but I just love it when my kids, my grandkids or my kids, uh, my, uh, you know, sometimes our son in Seattle calls us and sometimes one of the grandkids calls us. Sometimes it's just to say, Poppy, we're on our way. I love to hear their voice. Sometimes the youngest ones especially will pick up the phone, Poppy, we'll be there soon, you know, because I say, let me know when you're on your way. And um, I love it. I love hearing their voice. Do we let our Abba have that joy? Do you not think he has great joy when you say, Father in heaven? Oh, he does. And so 1 Peter 4, 7 says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And Yeshua gave a parable in Luke 18 about a persistent widow who wouldn't give up. 
And Yeshua used that example, Jesus does, that example of keep going, keep asking, even if you don't get the responses you think you should have by now, because my timing, Jesus says, is different than yours a lot of times. So he says in Luke 18, verse 1, and Luke 18, 8, 18, 1 comes right after Luke 17, that talks about all the very end time events, two people in the field, one taken, one left, and all of that. And then he says this, Luke 18, 1, he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not give up, not lose heart, don't get discouraged, don't quit. Always ought to pray, even if what you're praying for never seems to happen, even if what we're praying for seems to go the other way, the person we want to be healed dies or gets worse, we don't get the job we want, the answered prayers we hope for aren't coming the way we think they should be coming, don't lose heart. Because he goes on to say in verse 6 and 7 and 8 that, that you know, God will, God will avenge us speedily. God will answer us speedily. Don't give up. And don't lose faith like it might be in the last days. Will I find faith? He goes on to say. So when we're praying that doesn't happen, keep doing it. Keep, and, and, and add thanksgiving to it. Thanksgiving is the magic sauce that really makes a lot of our terrible times easier to handle. I, I gave a sermon on that, giving thanks in all things, for all things. As Paul tells us in, first, in, in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding will come upon you. And so as we pray, and, and are praying a lot, try to mix up a little bit. I try to worship as I pray, put my head right on the carpet. And I believe that if you study the word worship in Hebrew and Greek, you'll see that it has to do very much with bowing of the head, the bowing of the body, and the examples over and over that we have in Scripture. I'll read you one here in Revelation 7, 11. Let's put it up here. All the angels stood around the throne, and all the elders, 24 elders, and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. I'm urging you to do that. I don't mean necessarily every prayer. I'm not meaning all the time. But when something is super urgent, or you're feeling super convicted, wanting to really show your worshipful attitude, Get your head and face in the carpet, if you can. If you can't, God understands. But those of us who can, please do so. Sometimes I have to really <laughs> lean on some things to get back up. I need to get in better shape too. In Revelation 4, verses 9 to 11, it says that the 24 elders around God's throne actually fell down and cast their crowns towards the throne. And this concept of falling down, I'll put more scriptures on the on the on the on the, on the screen there is all through the book of revelation so do we ever pray that way ever ever do we ever pray that way face on the ground the word worship again means to have deep bowing it means to obey and all that true I, I know you know that but but think of worship as way down sometimes i'll bring worship music but again worship is face on face down but I'll bring what's called worship music and, and right in the middle of my praying, I'll pause, I'll talk to Father in heaven and just say, Father, my voice is going and I don't sing very well anymore, though I used to be in the ambassador choir and all that chorale. Father, please, uh, let me worship you and sing to you through these other voices that are so pretty. And then play the music for a few minutes and then pray some more, turn it off, pray some more, turn the music back on, pray some more. Do different things to come before God. So I want to challenge you. Pray as never before. Praying always, it says, I think in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 or something like that. Besides sleep and work, where do you spend most of your time? Are you on the Facebook more time than in prayer and Bible study? Are we, uh, at face, are, are we watching the news and watching conspiracy theories videos and Whatever else you're doing, more than relying and belonging to God, do you, spare more, do you spend more time with what's most important, that is prayer, and studying God's Word. I think of studying God's Word as God talking to me. And also when I pray, by the way, I stop. Quite often I'll stop. And I'll say, God, I've been gabbing for a long time here. I just want to shut up. And I grab my journal, my notepad, 
or piece of paper or anything I have handy to write on. I say, I'm going to shut up for a while. Will you talk to me? And if you don't choose to talk to me now during the next few days, can you talk to me? Give me strong urgings of what to do. Put your words in my head. And God will often answer those. Sometimes not right away, but sometimes they will. Some of us, myself included, got so wrapped up in this last election, and I've had to repent of that. Got so wrapped up in it that you would have thought I was a Republican, or some of you might have been Democrats, that you belonged to the Republican Party, belonged to the Democrats. So I had a friend named Sandra make a little card for me. She shows the uh, Republican elephant and Democrat uh, donkey uh, at it, going at it. And it says, as the elephants and donkeys go at it, remember, we belong to the Lamb of God. We don't belong to elephants and donkeys. Or have you forgotten that? If you look at your Facebook account, what would people think? That you belong to God or belong to the Democrats or belong to the Republicans? You and I were bought and paid for. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We just don't. Prayer should include also uh, praying that you be counted worthy to escape. All the terrifying things that are coming. Worse than anything the apostles went through. Because yes, they were persecuted. Yes, the early believers were beaten and jailed and even killed. Tortured. It's going to be worse than all of that because on top of all of that, the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan, the great tribulation, and the wrath of God after that, before Christ returns, is being poured out full, full burner, full, full blast on, on the whole world. And asteroids or little asteroids, near misses or, or hits in the ocean, the mountain burning like fire that falls in the ocean. Is that a meteorite? What is it? Where the, all the life in the sea dies and all of that. And all the earthquakes such as has never been seen on the planet ever before, as it says in one of the verses in Revelation. And lots of other earthquakes. But there's big stuff that will level mountains and make islands disappear. And so a lot's happening. on Pandemics, hurricanes, tsunamis that no one else experienced to this degree. So those who are faithful to God are going to be spared this, I really believe. Daniel 12, verse 1, at that time, Michael, the prince, who stands up over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there ever was a nation. Even so to that time, at that time, your people shall be delivered Everyone written in the book, the book of life. Everyone written. So there is a promise of deliverance. And there is the promise of deliverance in Luke 21, 36, where God says, Yeshua says to us, the Son of God says, Watch therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. If Yeshua knows, if Jesus knows that we are zealous, we will not deny his name. We will stand up even if our life depends on it. We won't give up on him. We will let people know where our faith is. And he knows that no matter what he can send our way, we will be faithful. If he already knows that, then he will not have to let us have to go through the great tribulation. Having said that, if you find yourself going through the great tribulation, then go through it with honor and dignity and die for him. Let that be the greatest honor. To remember, he died for you. You die for him. Don't fail that. And you will dine with him and eat with him if you do. So Revelation 12, Revelation 3 certainly indicate there may be safety for, for, for some. So point number one is pray like your life depends on it, because it does. Pray like, you're, like the world depends on you, because they do depend on you. Every single day, several times a day, spontaneous prayers, formal prayers, prayers of worship, prayers of adoration, coming into his presence with joy, and asking him to fill us, each of us, with the Holy Spirit, Asking him for the gifts of the Spirit. Asking him to 
heal his people, asking him to heal our land. Make that all a part of it. Point number one, pray as never before, often, deeply, fervently, especially in all the coming years. Point number two is what you might term a well-known verses or verses, uh, Matthew 5, 43 to 46, or 45 actually, Matthew 5, 43 to 45. And um, you know this really well. But I don't know that we're all really practicing it as I talk to various brethren. Okay, Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemies. Point number two, the very hard command to keep. Love your enemies. Love those who hate you. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Because this proves, he says, that you're a child of God. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, because he's like that. Children of the Father look like, walk like, act like their Father. He sends sun and he sends rain on the good and the bad, on the just and the unjust. So he's saying, you be like that. Because if you only talk to those or love those who love you, big deal. Big deal. Duh, we would say today. Everyone does that. He says, but you're called to be different. If people are hurting you, lying about you, taking you to court, putting you in jail, beating on you, none of us would enjoy that. But he's saying, learn to be like my son. Learn to be like Christ himself, who said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So genuinely loving, being kind to, praying, and doing good, those attacking us, that proves you're a child of God. He's saying, be like us, my father and I. Be patient. Be still doing good, even though bad people are doing bad things to you. I'm not there yet. I'm not obeying that command like I should yet. That's why I can have confidence that maybe some of you aren't either. But who is the one hurting you most? Who's attacking you the most? Love that person. Forgive that person from the heart. <sighs> to illustrate this, when the topic came up, the two great commandments, and the, 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 guy, the guy said, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and being, and everything else, and your neighbor is yourself, and then uh, Jesus said, great, go down, do likewise. The guy said, in the story of the Good Samaritan. <clears throat> I forget where that story is now, Luke 13 or something like that. But anyway, he says, he gives this parable where a despised person, a Samaritan, was the only one who would stop and help this probably knocked out, bleeding, hurting traveler who'd been set upon by thieves and robbers. And he said, who was the neighbor? And the guy couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said, I guess the guy who helped him. So, Yeshua, Jesus was saying, love your neighbor, even if that neighbor is a Samaritan, a despised person. Okay? So this is an unnatural but godly kind of love could become the very basis for God knowing if we're going to be counted worthy to escape the worst things. He knows if they're hurting our family, love, love them anyway. He knows if they bring us to court. He knows that if they're changing laws in the government that you can't stand and you despise what's happening in the country, you love them anyway. Yep, even them, the enemies. Yep, even them, those of the other party. First Peter 2.17. I'm going to read a couple more commands, all part of point two of loving and honoring. First Peter 2.17. Honor everyone. Honor all, it says. Love the brotherhood, fear God. Honor Nero. Honor the king. It was Nero at the time. Nero was so evil that he would take Christians and pour hot pitch on them, have people do this, hang them up on stakes in the garden, alive, light them on fire, and they're screaming 
wouldn't last forever. They would be burned, but he would light up his garden party. He thought that was so cool. He had his own horse as a senator. He was just a really bad, bad king. Peter says, guys, we're told by God, honor the king. So whoever is president, like him or not, whether you loved or despised Trump, whether you love or despise Biden, honor the king. First Timothy 2 verses 1 and 2 actually says, Therefore I exhort first that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all in authority. First Timothy 2, 1 and 2. That we might live a quiet life. Pray for them and pray that because of that prayer, they'll do things that will allow us to go on peaceably. If you keep on reading in verse 4 and 5, he says God really wants everybody to be saved. So this is part of honoring everybody, even despotic tyrants. Love them anyway. Honoring the king and leaders means no more name-calling in our Facebook accounts. No more name-calling. I'm just amazed. I don't mean any of you necessarily that I know are directly hearing this. But I know there are some that I know as Church of God members or believers in the Sabbath who are being very disrespectful or not obeying, not obeying this command to honor all. We need to repent of some of the meanness, name-calling, disrespectful things we're doing. I see a lot of believers going on rants against this one or that one. We're supposed to be praying for our leaders, all in authority. First Timothy 2 said, with thanksgiving. This kind of love is unimaginable, unbelievable, and impossible without God's Spirit and without praying a lot. These, you have to be praying for this. I tried to pray for some of Trump's, for Trump, and there are a lot of things about Trump that I, I couldn't stand about his nature. I prayed for him, prayed for his safety, and prayed for his guidance, prayed for his conversion, frankly. And then I started praying for Biden. I found it very hard. I started thanking God for Biden, as it says, with Thanksgiving. I found that very hard. I don't like a lot of things he's doing. But that's not my call. My call is to thank God for him, pray for him, ask God to protect him, ask God to open his heart, ask God to help him let us lead a peaceable life. Are you doing that? I'm finding it hard. I'm finding that hard to do. From my heart, I'm saying the words. I'm calling on you to ask God to let you do that from the heart. Let's be obedient. Let's be obedient. Why? Because this is the way God is. And God is the one who allowed him to be in office, says in Romans 13, right? Romans 5, verse 8, a verse we also know. And this is the way we're supposed to become just like our father, that we would be willing to die for Biden, to die for Kamala Harris, to die for Donald Trump, to die for the persecutors, to die for the BLM and Antifa, who might have burned down our business, to die for them and love your enemies. Pray for those who are hurting you, despitefully using you and persecuting you and doing bad things. Very hard commands. But if we're obedient to this now, we might well be spared what's coming up, brethren. God demonstrates his own love towards us, Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, we hadn't repented yet, we hadn't changed yet, Christ died for us. It also says in verse 6 that he died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the righteous, he died for all of us, the ungodly. So have we, we have to be so filled with this kind of love that it just pushes out anything else that's inside of us. Again, that's Christ's example on the cross. That was his example. That was Stephen's example as stones were crashing in on his head and ribs and his body. 
He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Acts 7, 60, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Are we going to obey that? Are we going to be like that? We can't be unless we have the love of God in our heart, unless we pray a lot and ask God to put his love inside of us. Point number three, the final point. I want to focus on this. A lot's been said about loving your enemies. Why? So we can do number three. Spread the good news to everyone. To dope peddlers. Yeah. To illegal aliens. Yes. For everyone. For criminals. Yes. Love your enemy. Spread the good news for the good people and the bad. Share what God Most High has shared with us. Want to share it. Open up about our greatest joy. Help make disciples of all people. That's the point. Point number three. Help make disciples of all people. Help people come to the Messiah. Help them come to see the kingdom of God. Help them come to the knowledge of the truth. This is more than a doctrine. It's pe bringing people personally to come to know the Christ in their hearts and meet him. Take them with you to meet him. Christ won't come until one thing happens. In Matthew 24, he said, before the end comes, all these things will happen. And he lists the false prophets and wars and rumors of wars and pandemics and famines and droughts and earthquakes in various places. He goes on and on. And he, and he says it's going to be really bad tribulation and really bad time. And then he says, lawlessness will abound, Matthew 24, 12. The love of many will grow cold. It's hard to keep your love when so many bad things are happening around you and to you and me. But we have to love anyway. But we have to share anyway. Matthew 24, 14 is point number three. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Has that happened yet? I asked Carol, my wife, do you think the gospel's been preached throughout all the world already? You know her quick answer? <laughs> I thought it was genius. She said, honey, if it's already been preached throughout all the world, Christ would be here. Because that's what he says, right? <laughs> then the end will come. So the answer is no, it hasn't been finished yet. It's getting done, but it's not finished yet. There are places in the world that if you own a Bible, you're going to be tortured and then killed. And then your kids killed. In whole nations like that. There are whole nations where anyone who says that they believe in Jesus Christ, they're being punished in jail in Iran, in Cambodia, in Laos, in China, in Vietnam, in, 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 in Iraq, and, and many of the Muslim countries. I, I subscribe to something called... Uh, martyrs something about the martyrs so um, it, it tells you all about what's going on in these other countries why do we pray for those who we don't like those in government <laughs> as first timothy 2 said so that, because we understand that god loves everybody and would like them all to be saved as it goes on to say in verses 3 and 4 if we really understood what a great pearl of price god's been god's given us we want to share that if we really understood what a great eternal purpose and calling and future we all have. We want others to be in the first resurrection as well. And Jesus told his disciples, what? Matthew 28, 19, 20. What did he tell them? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Teach, all, teach everyone, baptize everyone. They were to go out to all the world, make disciples of everyone, teach them, disciple them. Have you and I discipled anybody? Someone discipled you. Have you discipled anybody? And he says, I'll be with you till the end of the age. I've got it underlined in there. That's us. That wasn't the 12 or 11 disciple, uh, uh, disciples at this point. It was, it was us he's talking to here. I am with you always, even at the very end of the age. He's talking to you. What's your name? He's talking to you there. Go disciple all nations. Now, if you had your roots in the Church of God of old, 
Worldwide Church of God or some of the other breakoffs. So many of them indoctrinated us, knowingly or not knowingly, not to evangelize. And here were the reasons why. We were supposed to pay and pray only, right? And support those who uh, knew how to do it properly. The ministry, in other words. I say that in jest, but that's what we were told. It's no use, we were told. Why bother? Because you can't disciple anybody unless God opens their mind first and calls them first. Right? John 6, 44. So you might just be wasting your time. And I heard over and over, I'm not, you're not the preacher anyway. Uh, that's a preacher's job. And you don't want to cram your religion down anybody's throat, do you, if they don't want it. So don't be doing that. Don't be cramming your religion down. God has to call them first anyway, and you're not a minister. It's not your job. So wrong. So wrong. The early church, they remember Jesus' words. Someone asked him in John 6, 28, 29, We'd like to do the works of God. So what is the work of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is God's work. This is the work of God. That you believe in him whom he sent. The work of God ultimately is believing in him whom God sends. But the work of God at different other times could be building an ark and preaching to people about the coming de devastation and destruction if they don't repent. The work of God could be going to Nineveh, telling them to repent, or God's going to destroy the city. But ultimately, the work of God is believing in the one whom he sent, in, in, in the Christ. Turn to Acts 8, verses 1 to 4 in your Bible, or I'll, or we'll put it up here. If we really understood that, we'll be doing everything we could to help people understand and believe and come to know the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, and the kingdom of God. Here's what the early Jerusalem believers did. First of all, after Stephen was stoned and killed in Acts 7, we come to Acts 8, no, no separation of time. Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, uh, which was at Jerusalem, so bad that they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. They had to leave Dodge. They had to get out of Dodge. They had to leave town. They were thrown out of their houses. Everybody was scattered except the apostles. So what we're about to read was not about the, disciples, the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen and buried him with much lamentation. Yes, men, it's okay to cry and lament at a funeral. Our northern European roots don't encourage that. But the Bible example is fine. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house of the believers and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Can you imagine being dragged out of your house by the man who wrote most of the New Testament? <laughs> Therefore, those who were scattered, look at verse 4, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Notice these were the apostles. These were those who were scattered. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem, preaching the word. They couldn't keep it inside. If you and I had been kicked out of our city, out of our homes, out of our country, because of the name of Jesus, would you be talking about that name as you went other places? They did. They did. Because it was too exciting. It was greater than their home, greater than all their possessions, greater than their jobs, greater than their monies, greater than their 401ks. And because they realized they were priests, even the women, if we're called and have God's Holy Spirit, we are priests of God. Priests are taught to tell people about God, bring people to God, teach them God's way, lead them to God, pray with them, offer to if they're sick or hurting. Priests love showing the way to God. And they share and these people shared because of their love for people that they've learned to have, even their enemies. I mean, Yeshua taught, Jesus talked to Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus became a secret disciple for a time until the very end. He finally came out of the closet. And it's time for all of us to come out of the closet of being secret disciples. It's time. Forget the indoctrination of the past that 
you can't do it. Don't worry. It's God's got to call them. It's his job. It's the minister's job. Don't do that. We have people who, uh, we have church groups that will prohibit members getting together to talk about the Bible unless a minister is present. And I can understand why. There have been some problems. But Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there with them also. Matthew 18, 20. So we didn't share our joy in the past with others, our excitement with our neighbors, our workmates, our friends, people at work, because we weren't really encouraged to. I'm encouraging you to. I really am. Philip, just a deacon, went to Samaria. And in Samaria, he told everybody about Jesus and the kingdom. And there are two verses in Acts 8 that talks about Jesus preaching Christ and preaching the kingdom. So he preached both. And God tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 10, that when his word goes out, it's not going to be empty. It might seem like the seed is taking a long time to bear anything. We don't see any growth for a while. We wonder if anything's going to happen. It shall not return to me void. But it will accomplish what I sent it to do, what I please, he says. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So... Philip went to Samaria, baptized, had great wonders and works, a regular member, a deacon, doing great miracles. God was with him. He didn't lay hands on him. Peter and John came back later to lay hands on to receive the Holy Spirit because the laying on of hands needs to come from an ordained minister. I really believe that. The laying on of hands for receiving the Holy Spirit specifically. Uh, I'm not saying that you parents get put your hands on your children if they're sick. I, I, I encourage you to do that. But to receive the Holy Spirit is something I believe is from a minister of God or else Philip would have done it. But instead he went back, told them in Jerusalem all about what happened. And uh, they sent John and Peter. So in Acts 11, let's pick up what happened to those people who spread the word. In Acts 11... Uh, this is the byproduct of it all, Acts 11, verses 19 to 21. Those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, Acts 8, remember, now we're in Acts 11, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, that's a long ways away, that's a whole island away, Antioch, that was about 300 miles away from um, Jerusalem, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only, but some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, they decided, hey, why, why just keep it to Jews? Let's talk to the Greeks, the Grecians, the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. That's who they preached, the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. He liked that. He blessed them. A great number of who? Grecians, Gentiles, Hellenists turned to the Lord. Not just Jews were being called. The news got back. And the, so the church at Antioch, I think it was Antioch, sent uh, Barnabas and Paul. And Barnabas invited Paul, actually, because Barnabas understood that the work of going to the Gentiles was given as a priority to Paul. And so he wanted Paul in on this. And then Paul began his great journeys and work. They spent a year teaching the people in Antioch and became a great base. My point is, all of what we've just read happened because you're a praying person. Happened because you love your enemies. Happened because you don't stay in the closet anymore as a believer in Christ. Happen because you want to share it. You can't hold it in. You can't hold it in anymore. Would you have talked about Jesus if you'd been thrust out of your home? Well, they did. They were no more secret disciples. Do you know what I don't see in this early church? I don't see any verses saying, but they hung around waiting to try to figure out whom God was calling. They hung around till they had a minister who could come with them. There were no ministers until those who were from Cyrene and Cyprus came back and started preaching, regular members, to the people around them. Then there were so many people there, then they sent Barnabas, later on Paul. Do you see the difference? You and I have been called to share this. We haven't been doing it. Maybe a handful of you have. If you can point to a bunch of people that have come into the church because of you and your preaching, hallelujah. If you can't, turn that around. 
You can also, 2 Peter 3, verses 1 and 11 and 12, Therefore, since these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons you ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. See, our preaching won't mean a whole lot because the best sermon you and I can preach, boy, do I preach to myself on this. The best sermon I can preach is a life that has changed, a life that is godly now, a life that is in Christ, a life that is not the sins of the past, a life that's different. So we're called to have a holy conduct and godliness, 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Hastening that coming of the day of God. And so other verses say speeding it along, hurrying it up. Now, I don't know if that means literally that the more people we can bring to Christ, that that will shorten the time even more. I kind of think it does mean that. You have a hand in that. I'm saying get the word out. If you look at Philippians 1, verses 12 to 14, we see here that Paul, he took every opportunity to get the gospel out. And he's saying to the Philippians church in Philippi, don't be discouraged because I am in jail, have chains on me. Hey, sometimes I got these Romans chained to me. I share the gospel with them. So that's what he said. It's, got, it's, it's, it's turned out to furthering the gospel. So that the whole palace guard, the Praetorian guard, knows all about this. And that my chains are in somebody called the Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, here in Rome, he's saying, have become confident by my chains, are much more bold now to speak the word without fear. Who is speaking the word? Did you notice that? It's not Paul that he's referring to who got bold to speak the word. He says the brethren... The brethren got bold because they saw me not holding back, even though I was in chains because of it. Brethren, the calling is high. Let's do it. Let's obey this command to make disciples of all nations. Don't cram it down their throats. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies between, uh, in, in, in you if, uh, when you're asked for the reason for the hope. You know that verse. But do explain things. Philippians 4.22, even those of Caesar's household were becoming saints and they were greeting the people in Philippi. Caesar's household. If we really love people, we'll want them to know the same truth. We'll want them to know the path. We'll want them to know the way. We'll want them to know the kingdom. We'll want them to know Jesus, the Christ the Messiah, the Son of God. We would want them to be a part of all of that too. God's word says you won't, what you sow won't come back empty. A lot of what we sow might come back in the great tribulation, people. It says in Revelation 7, verses 8 to 14, that a great number beyond counting, so many were they, have come out of the great tribulation, repenting before God during that time finally. The seed that you and I and everyone else involved planted, starting to bear fruit, and a great number we can't count, comes out of the great tribulation. Their sins washed, washed away in the blood of the Lamb, made white in the blood of the Lamb. So the seed may not seem to be evident. I am talking to my neighbors about Jesus. I prayed with one about her cancer. She was healed, by the way. Unbelievable. When I say unbelievable, I mean, I just wish I'd see more of it. I prayed for my brother and sister with their severe stuff. They haven't been healed yet. This lady three houses down, or was it, yeah, three houses down, has cancer real bad, had it real bad. She's totally healed of it now. And so she said the last time the doctor saw her, she said, he, he said, nothing in the record now. Nothing. It's all gone. But I didn't talk to her about the Sabbath. I didn't talk to her about the holy days. I didn't talk to her about pork. I talked to her about Jesus is alive and well and can still heal you. Do you believe that? I, if you do, I'd like to pray with you. Can I? And we did. And she's telling others about it. Okay, she's not attending our church yet. It doesn't matter. The seed's been planted. I had a friend who used to wear a cap that simply said John 3.16 on it. He said his golf buddies wouldn't swear so much when he wore that cap. Some asked him what that meant. And so he talked to them about Jesus. I have a man I used to work for 
we had a conference in my business, a big conference in New Orleans. And then we got on a plane. We had not planned this together. And we found ourselves seating side by side, seated side by side. That was not one of these when you just go in. I mean, these were ones where you buy the, the seat. We didn't know it. So I thought, man, this is unusual. They're right side by side. And he says, Philip, it's a long three or four hour trip back to Portland. So um, tell me, why don't you come to our Saturday meetings? Why don't you come to our Christmas parties? And I said, Mike, do you have your Bible with you? And he said, yes, he did. And he pulled it out and we began a long discussion about Jesus, about the word, about the truth. And the Sabbath did come up, of course, because he asked about that. And I talked about how they kept the Sabbath and the holy days. I, I focused on the Sabbath in particular. Mike is now a believer. He keeps the Sabbath with his wife and his children, who are staunch believers. And Mike, in turn, has gone and discipled dozens of people who meet in a group where he lives there in Oregon. If they wonder, so if people wonder where you go at feast time, don't just say, I go on vacation, it's my annual trip away. Tell them the truth. I go to, I go to worship my king. I go to worship my king. That's what Zechariah says. If any of the nations don't come up to worship the king, worship the king, right? That's why we go to the feast. Not just because we're told to. We go to worship. We go to learn to fear him and obey him. And we learn to rejoice before him. We go to worship. If they want more, you give more details. If they don't, you leave it there. It's seed planted. Back in the 1980s and serving in Northeast Canada, we had one church. This wasn't duplicated in other places. But this one church, they had never grown for years and years and years. And finally, in the next three years, they doubled because I preached something similar to this over there. And they began talking to brothers, sisters, cousins, nephews, neighbors. Uh, one man, I, I went to him in church. I said, you're married. Why is your wife not here? Well, she doesn't want to come. I said, did she tell you that? She says, no, I don't want to bug her, though. I said, pray about it and then ask her. So he prayed about it. He went up to her and said, honey, do you want to go to services? And she says, yeah, I'll get, I'll get ready and go. And then he says, why didn't you come before? And she said, because you never asked. So she brought herself and her, and her children. Uh, there, there was a, a woman who came who had two sisters. And uh, her example of her life, the greatest sermon we can have, changed so much. I got a phone call out of the blue from one of her sisters. And she said, Philip, whatever you've done for my sister, I want you to do for me. I said, what do you mean? Well, she used to not be so sweet. She is so sweet. She's an angel now. I, I want that. I am, because I am such a, the word begins with B. I am such, <laughs> and I want to be an angel like her. And I said, all I did is point her to Jesus. But yeah, you can come. And on and on and on and like that, the stories like that. So in three years, the attendance doubled. Let's wrap it up. Brethren, love God. Love him so much that you want to go before him in joy. Pray like never before. Like your whole life depends on it, because it does. Pray you be kind of worthy to escape. Pray that you be an example to everyone around you. Start spending more time in prayer than you do in the news, than you do in Facebook. Please, 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 let's do it. As a body, let's do it. Number two, love your enemies. Show grace to those who are not very kind and nice to you. Honor the king. Pray for those in authority with thanksgiving. All of them, Biden, Kamala, Trump, Obama, when he was, all of them. And in your countries, if you're hearing this in other countries, the same thing over there. Even people you despise, don't despise them anymore, love them. Number three, come out of your Christian closet. Start being more open about your beliefs. If you can have a Bible at work, take a Bible to work. Have it sitting on your desk. Put a John 3.16 on your cap. Start being honest and open about it. Spread the gospel, spread the good news, and hasten the coming, the return of our Lord. May our God be with you all and bless you all. i got to leave it now at this point. Thank you for coming, all of you, and God be with you. Hopefully, hopefully we see each other soon and can give each other a big handshake and hug and not just a fist bump or an elbow bump. <laughs> May God come back soon through Christ. Amen and amen. Father in heaven, we come before you now. We just want to thank you so much that we can 
approach you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anytime we want to come to you, the, our Father, our Daddy, and yet you're also God Most High. Father in heaven, help us to want to seek you more, to actually make the time to, not just make the time, but we want to. We just, we're just there. We know that we have to abide in you and Jesus because that's the only way we will have the strength and the ability to do all the things that you tell us. Help us now to also love everyone. Help us, Father in heaven, to obey you on that. We can only do it by your spirit, by your presence in us. It's because you, being a God of love, you are love, that we can become people of love if you will fill our hearts and minds with what you are, with your presence. Help us understand people are hurting, and not to be tough on them, but it doesn't mean we have to condone what they do or accept everything they do but we do have to love them, love our enemies, and help us to then share this with everybody we can all around the world, everywhere we can, everybody who wants to hear about it. Lead us to people you are calling. Lead us to people whose minds you're opening and help us know how to do it because this is not something many of us are experienced doing, but help us to openly talk about you. What a wonderful Father and Savior we have. Now, Father, we ask your dismissal and be on those who are hurting, who need healing, who are in difficult situations. And may your kingdom come. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money, however, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.